What happens when you blow a protein up larger than the size of a human? Dr. Kiki's Science Hour is up next with your guest host this week, me, David Harris. We'll be talking about science sculpture with Julian Voss Andre. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for Dr. Kiki's Science Hour is provided by Cashfly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This is Dr. Kiki's Science Hour. This week, I'm David Harris filling in for Dr. Kiki. Episode number 85, recorded on Thursday, March 3rd, 2011, Science Sculpture. What happens when you blow a protein up larger than the size of a human? We'll answer this question and many more in today's chat with science sculptor Julian Voss Andre. Welcome to Dr. Kiki's Science Hour. One hour, one topic, and one expert. I'm David Harris, and I'll be your host for the next hour. Dr. Kiki is away on maternity leave, and we wish her all the best. Our guest today is an artist I came across a few years ago and whose work I've followed ever since, Julian Voss Andre. Now, Julian studied physics at the universities of Vienna, Berlin, and Edinburgh before turning his hand to art. He began as a painter, but moved towards sculpture, where he's really made his name in science art. He's now settled in Portland, where he has an industrial strength studio kitted out for metalwork and hardcore welding for the innumerable pieces of steel that go into many of his creations. Today, we're going to talk about his work, his path to sculpture, and how science and art play together. Welcome, Julian Voss Andre. Hi. Nice How to be here. Thank you. Very good. That, thanks. That's great. Look, I wanted to, to dive right into this and show some of your work to begin with, because, you know, as an artist, we could sit and uh, we can talk about all sorts of things, but really, we just want to show some of your work to begin with. And I'd like to start with one of your uh, largest pieces, I believe, called Angel of the West. And we'll pull up an image of this in just one second. Here we go. And perhaps, uh, Julian, you could just talk us through uh, this particular work and tell us a bit about it. Okay. Well, um, it, it started in 2005 when I was asked if I had an idea to make a sculpture based on the human antibody molecule. molecule. And the, you have to know that the human antibody molecule is, is one of the key molecules in our immune system. When we have a, a virus in our body, then we all know that the immune system somehow recognized that, but the, the, the actual uh, piece of matter that recognized that is, is this Y-shaped molecule where the two top arms of the Y kind of wave around like arms and click very specifically into a pathogen, like a piece of a virus, for example. Um, so I was playing around with that idea of that image, and, and finally I ended up, for fun, superimposing this Y shape onto onto the human body, as we as as it's drawn by Leonardo da Vinci in his famous Vitruvian Man drawing, and I noticed that there's a really like an odd and striking correlation between the two images without only changing the size, scaling it up, but not changing the aspect ratio. For example, the 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 guy's two sets of arms uh, were exactly located exactly that's the image where where the where the two these two waving arms of the of the antibodies are and and I, that was so intriguing that i decided to keep that analogy and so i ended up basically making a ring around the structure of the antibody and and kind of and 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 then i added these these rays which you can see in the sculpture which part of the reason is for support reasons and other but it also they all end up at the point where the head would be if there was the human being still there. So I took the human out, of course, only the antibodies left and the ring, and then all these, these rays that now it looks like rays of an angel point at the, at the middle of the, of, the, of the piece there where the head would be located between the eyes. And so that was the design idea. Okay, and this isn't just sitting in your backyard uh, or in your studio. Tell us about uh, how you came to actually make this piece, uh, who commissioned it, and where it's sitting now. I was asked by people from the Scripps Institute in, in Florida. There's the Scripps Institute in, 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 in California, of course, and they, they, a few years ago they opened a new campus in, in California. And um, they wanted to honor Dr. Lerner, who is, who is the, 
the director of the of the institute there, who, who had done himself a lot of studies with with the antibody, and also um, it's 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 such a neat kind of symbol because in a way these antibody molecules are our, is our, our our eyes to the world of the of the proteins because we we build in in, in the quotation marks very specific antibodies to to tag onto a, any molecule of interest and that's our way in in in, in the biological sciences often to 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 mark them or to to find them and to study the reactions of them um so and yeah yeah that's basically the story so and then i, I proposed it and, and they they liked the idea quite a bit and that, so we ended up doing it uh, but it was a long process from from the beginning of the, of the proposal in 2005 to the actual installation in 2008 and how long, uh, how much of that time are you actually there with your hands on metal building? Yeah, it's well, I mean, an em enormous amount of time was to get the proposal done, which, in which was the main, the main design work. I mean, you have to imagine you have to get from the protein database, from the data bank information of the, of the 3D structure of the molecule, you have to get it into a three dimensional model in the computer. And, and, and from there, you have to get cutting instructions. So uh, on the way, you need an engineer to find out what thickness of steel do you need for which different parts in order to make this structurally sound enough. Um, so that's, that's a big deal before you even start using your hands at all, only through typing on the computer. Um, right. So, yeah. So I think this is an important point to, to bring out, that this isn't just uh, what some people would call an artist's representation of the molecule. This is the real molecule. You've taken it from the, the data itself. You mentioned the protein it, data bank. It, right. it is both in, in some ways. I mean, it is a representation in the sense that I'm, well, it's, 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 it's a, let me start like this. What I'm doing is basically a, a protein is, is, a, is an amino acid chain that winds through space. And what I'm taking is instead of all the thousand atoms of the side chains and the atoms that make up each amino acid, I take only the point where it goes through space. So it's called the backbone, the, the backbone of the protein. So and, and then I, my idea, my initial idea was to use the technique of mitered cut to take a piece of square tubing, for example, cut it into segments and then reassemble it to make a three dimensional thing. And um, so that was my idea. So in a way, it is it is a a direct faithful mapping of reality by you because I'm using the actual protein data. On the other hand, it's a strong abstraction because that's not how a molecule looks like. You can't even talk about look like at that scale because it's much smaller than the, wife, the wavelength of light, of course. Right, of course. Now, um, we've got uh, another piece which I, I'd like to show because it's uh, kind of a simpler version and maybe an earlier evolution of this type of protein folding structure that you've made. And it's also another piece that was done in honor of a person. And I'm talking about the alpha helix for Linus Pauling. Um, and maybe you could tell us a little about that and where this is located. Yeah, that's that's actually located here in Portland, pretty close to where I live now. And 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 that was the first public art piece I made. So the story was at that time I was still a student, and I I noticed that I was intrigued by these protein structures, and I had started making taking Douglas firs and cutting them into mitered cuts and making what's called an alpha helix, which is a, a spiraling protein element. So if you take the amino acids I was talking about and make a spiral out of them. Then that that is a, that is something that was um, that 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 was predicted theoretically by Linus Pauling in '53, I believe, and and then later on confirmed by 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 X-ray studies that this is a reoccurring element in many many proteins. You see the spiral all over the place, and when I was seeing that that I, I read up about um, Pauling, who was by the way the only person to ever win two unshared Nobel prizes, and he is from Portland, Oregon. I thought it was so cool because I lived here too. Um, and at the, at the same time, I'm using the Oregon State Tree, the Oregon, the, the, the Douglas fir. So I was thinking maybe there are people who want to commission me to make some sort of memorial or something. And I was thinking along the lines of taking this tree and then make a bronze cast version for this, for, for, of the, this natural alpha helix structure. Um, so I met, I, I met the architect who, was, who had proposed a, a memorial site or like a science center in his name that so far hasn't happened yet. But she hooked me up with a with a person who is who is interested in Pauling's memory in Portland. He organizes um, a great series of lectures here at the, at the big concert hall, 
and and so I talked with him and we chatted about physics for about three hours and so and and then he said well that'd be a great idea but we don't have much money so I, I went back to, to 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 my place and thought about it and then I realized if I just take one steel beam and cut it up like that that'd be a, a really kind of a low budget version of that and, and also at the same time it has this cool constructivist quality which fits so well with the Lego block idea of biochemistry, at least of that aspect of biochemistry. Um, so I ended up do, making this piece as a student that was part of my, my, my PH, no, not PH, BF, BFA thesis at the, at the local art college. Hey, you mentioned that this is like uh, Lego blocks, but obviously you don't buy pieces of alpha helices made out of steel um, on the block. How, how do you actually get to these forms? Because they're pretty complicated shapes that you're putting yeah. together. Yeah, it, it was easier back when I was 10 years old and I could just get a, get a big Lego set for Christmas. Um, now it's, it's got a little more difficult and it got a bit, bit bigger too. So what I'm doing is I'm, I wrote a piece of software that takes the 3D points in space of the position of the amino acids. This kind of, it's like a, like a pearl necklace, you know, wound into space, so points in space, and, and calculates... Um, cutting instructions out of those, which I need to apply to, for example, the steel beam, in order to, when I assemble it again, make, visit all these points in space again. I'm not sure if that was very clear, but um, it's, 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 it's in principle pretty simple. The, the actual software to write was a bit complicated because you have to follow with Euler rotations, you have to follow through space and, 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 and do all the bookkeeping of the variables, of course. So at that time, what I did is, is I, I got a set of, of, of numbers, basically, say, telling me the cutting planes along the beam. So I would take a tape measure, literally, and a protractor and measure it all out. And then I, and in that case, I cut it with a plasma cutter, that's, which is a device to cut thick steel, and um, cut it up and reassemble it and weld it together. So that's what I did then. Later okay, so, for peace. Yeah, sorry. So, so let me show, uh, see if I've got this uh, technique right. You actually okay. start with a we start with a straight beam that just goes all the way exactly. along, and then you, cut, totally then you cut through it on angles, and then exactly. twist the pieces, and exactly. uh, they form at a new angle. Yeah, if you think about a picture frame, it's very simple. Just take a piece of square lumber and do a forty-five degree cut. Then you twist one of the pieces spin it 180 degrees, and then you have a 90 degree angle, okay? You can do the same thing, not only in two dimensions, but in three. If you, if you do what's called a comp compound miter cut, you can do all sorts of cuts and all sorts of um, uh, planes, and then if you reassemble and glue it back together, it will go all over the place. This originally one dimensional material will go in three dimensions, basically. So it's and a kind steep. of a steel beam origami. It is, it is related, actually, yes. And it's no, co no co coincidence that one of the main origami mathematicians looks into protein folding too, by the way. Um, it, it's, it's intriguing to me because DNA is one-dimensional. It's a one-dimensional strand of information, and we are not. We are three-dimensional. And if you ask yourself where exactly does that happen, that transition, it's where the proteins get folded from a chain into a coil in space, a thing that you know, has width and length and height and not just length. Mm -hmm. Now, when I was looking through uh, your quite large body of work online, and uh, people will see on the screen the, the web address uh, for your site where they can come and visit you, but it's julianvossandre.com, um, I, I saw some of your sketches that look like they were computer generated and then annotated by hand of a plan for a sculpture called Green Fluorescent Protein. And I, yeah. I think we've got a picture of that which we can uh, show so some of your work in, in progress. So uh, maybe you could talk us through how this, this sculpture came about. Okay, yeah, that was actually the, the very first time. This, this is, a, is a specific protein, it's called the green fluorescent protein. And, and you find it in nature in, in certain jellyfish in the, in the Pacific Northwest. So in front of Seattle, so to speak, and in, in the ocean out, out there, for example. And, and this protein is like a little lantern. It makes these jellyfish glow green. So they suddenly, when they are frightened, for example, they flash out as a flash of green light. Um, and in the 60s, 1960s, there was a Japanese scientist in, in, in the Friday Harbor Labs, which is on, the, in, on San Juan Islands, which is offshore of Seattle. 
um, and he collected, depending on, on who you ask, about 200,000 up to 1 million of those jellyfish and then condensed them into like a minute powder which glows green under UV light. And turns out in the 90s, there has been, it was clear that, that, that this is a, this molecule in itself has amazing ability to, 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 to do the glow green, the, the, the glowing um, business all by itself without needing any specific biochemistry from, from the body. So um, it, 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 since then, since the 90s, I believe, it was, it was people started using it, taking the sequence of DNA that encodes this green fluorescent protein and adding it to, to a, a different organism like a dog or a mouse or whatever. And attaching it to a, to a protein sequence they're interested in. So what happens is they ex the, the body expresses that protein of their interest plus the little green lantern, and then they can shine UV light on it to activate it, and then they see a green glowing dot, and they know, aha, there's my protein. So it has an amazing um, use it, it has found in the last decades in, in the biological sciences, this GFP. And that's actually the 2008 Chemistry Nobel Prize was for that. Um, I think it's... I think it's not the only piece uh, that you've based on yeah. work that has received Nobel prizes when we when we yeah, look it all fun. up. Yeah, um, but in this case, that was actually it's one thing. Let me mention that when when I was still in Vienna doing my my thesis work in physics, we were looking at expanding my work. We were looking at, at using bigger molecules to to show quantum properties of them. And at that time, my girlfriend was in America in Portland. And she is a neuroscientist, or was at that time, she did her PhD then, and I asked her, do you know any cool protein which we could use for that? Because as a physicist, I knew nothing, of course, about the, the world of protein structure and proteins in general. And so she said, have you looked at GFP? And, and I, I looked it up, and what popped up was in Google uh, an, an image of the structure itself. And, and that totally floored me, because I've, I, I, it, this was kind of, it, I felt this was the transition between the, the constructivist world of the small molecule, like water molecules, where, where math pretty much applies in a straightforward way, and then the complicated, complex, warm, organic world of our bodies. So that was kind of like the missing link in my thinking, basically, at the time. And that's why I was so intrigued. So in 99, I saw this molecule. And so when I went to art college and I had the idea to do proteins, the first thing I really wanted to do was to find out how to manage to make a GFP. That was like my, my kind of my, my beacon in a way, my green lantern. <laughs> well, maybe we can have a look at the, the finished piece as well, which uh, <laughs> naturally is painted green. Uh, that, yeah, where, where... that was the first version, right? Yeah, how many, you have multiple versions of this one? I, I, had, I had made a second version, which is now at the, at, actually at this marine lab in, in, on, on Friday, in Friday Harbor Labs on, on San Juan Island. There's a second version. Oh, fantastic. Um, yeah. Now, you, you said you started as a physicist, uh, and uh, I'm guessing it wasn't in the biophysics of proteins. Uh, oh. How did you make that transition? Uh, did you have to learn a lot more science to, to be able to take on these projects that are biologically based? Yes, but, but, but in a very different way than in a university setting. When you, I mean, it was more playful. You know, I, I, I came across the proteins when we tried to expand from the buckyball structures to bigger molecules and i had an open mind basically and but but then i saw these images and and when, a few years later when i started doing art based on those structures i it was just fun you know whenever what something interested me and i was looking for inspiration i would just go i would go into pretty deep detail and and partly read the research papers um depending on the pieces sometimes it's enough or even better to know not too much about it and to just go with the structure, what you love about it. But in some cases, I, you know, I, it was about actually looking at the absolute, at the, at the state of the art known detail of the things, which is really fun too, of course. Yeah, now uh, you mentioned the buckyballs that you were studying. Uh, maybe we can go back a stage in your career, just hear a little about the, the physics that you were doing, because I think that's pretty interesting uh, stuff in itself. Yeah, yeah, that was really interesting. I was very fortunate that I did my my, my thesis work. I studied in the in University of Berlin, but I, but the, uh, one physicist came by and gave a talk there, and his name is Anton Seiding, and he's one of the the main people who research the borderline between 
quantum physics and philosophy. So he, do, he does all very many experiments, which not so much like a technical kind of desire to understand stuff, but, but he really wants to understand what is, what, why are we having these problems with quantum physics? What is the transition between our world of classical physics, what we understand and what, we, what our brains are evolved to, to into, into it, into it and, 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 the, and, the, and the world of quantum physics, which works obviously very differently. Um, so when he came by, I asked him if I could do my thesis at his, at his lab. Um, let me just hang this off. And, and, and it turned out I could do that. And at that time, he just started a subgroup with a, with a postdoc named Marcus Arndt, and, and he, he built up um, the first meta wave interferometer in this group. So usually they had been doing only neutrons in the 70s and then in the 80s and 90s, mostly photons. So they, they looked at, at, at all the quantum physics with photons. And, and now came this postdoc who, who basically started up this, this sub lab where they looked at actual matter with mass and, and, and tried to see if, uh, to how big a chunk of matter you can still have that you that you, that you still have to see quantum quantum properties in that case it's conceptually a very simple experiment what uh, originally um, proposed by roger penrose um, the idea was to take a, a c60 molecule a, a, the buckyball which is a pretty fat molecule and and send it through something like a double slit experiment so in that case it was a grading but it's for all practical purposes it's like a double slit so what you see in the sense, in, in case of photons and small atoms and and electrons, you see an interference pattern. You don't see the 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 molecules or the atoms go through one uh, a slit at a time, but you see a mix of both in the sense that they interfere with each other. So each individual quantum object goes through both opening at once and then interferes with itself and makes an interference pattern on the screen. Um, and and it turned out that the same is true for those very massive particles. Right, and now um, I, we might be able to show a picture of the buckyball because I know that you've made a sculpture of it as well that you had in an exhibition. Yes. I've just sent a link through to the producer. We'll see whether or not we can uh, pull that one up um, yeah. in, in a minute. Um, but uh, something that I, I wanted to, to start talking about, um, well, actually, let, while we're talking quantum physics, we, you, you've done quite a few experiments, uh, quite a, created quite a few art pieces that yeah. are uh, trying to explore the nature of quantum physics. And it seems that you have a real theme of connecting the quantum world, which is the world of the very small, with the human size world. And uh, you, I think, probably um, show this off particularly well in, in, a, in a series called Quantum Man and Quantum Woman. And uh, we also have some pictures of that, which we, uh, which we should be able to show in just a minute. But uh, could you start to tell us a bit more about Quantum Man? Oh, hang on. Here we have uh, one of the buckyballs that, okay, that we're yes. showing. That's, that's a stereoscopic image um, that somebody who took the photo sent me. So I put that on my website. That, that was a huge buckyball, 30 feet diameter, 9 meters, which, which hangs in these trees there. So there are these three Douglas firs, and it's attached on the top, and, and it's about arm's reach above you when you're under it. And there's a little creek and a little um, a little slope of the creek down under it. It's 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 really cool how it's sitting there. Yeah, that's a, a, an impressive piece. What what did it take to to hang that in the trees? It took well. The first the, the, originally it was installed for a temporary show in a in a state park. And then what I did there is I started up from the bottom and thought, yeah, we just build it up. And exactly, those are the joints. There are 90 of those, no, 60 of those, of course, 90 struts. So we started up on the bottom. And then I, at some point, my ladders ran out in height. So, and I just didn't know what to do anymore. So I was already toying with the thought of making a failed kind of buckyball, like making basically a dome shape and like a one, one looking up. But a, a friend of mine, um, and suggested to build a scaffolding, which I hadn't considered at that time. So I built a scaffolding, and then and then we were able to to finish the whole thing off with like brute force, basically by pulling it up because gravity is against you with this thing. So with the second install, we were much smarter. We did we hired a company to build a scaffolding 40 feet high in in and for all the width. So the whole thing was full of scaffold, 
And then we just went from the top down. We just hung it up and then disassembled the scaffolding while going down and then it was ready. It was a breeze compared to the first version. It was, that was really scary. It was so scary up there because you, it's, you have to imagine, you know, you, you, you have to pull the full force, pull these things together because they don't want to go together. You know, it's like a, like a thermodynamic argument. There's many ways to not stick together and only yeah. one that they actually fit. So, um, yeah, that was fun. Did you ever get any of the pieces mixed up or uh, find you, you put, thing, put them in the wrong place? Um, no, but what I kind of didn't realize is that each of these vertices, they, they, have, a, they have handedness to them. They, they, they are not just a simple Mercedes star bend a little bit. They, there's two angles are the same and one angle is a different one. I mean, it's obvious when you know it, but if you don't know it and you're trying to build one, it's, it's something you learn, you know, because there's two hexagons touching one pentagon. Mm. Yeah, you can see that. Here. Yeah, so, so that was actually striking. So that's why the green paint you could see in the photo of the vertex, you could see a little bit of green paint that marked that one. Right, because uh, if they're all the same shape, they'd be roughly uh, in a plane 120 degrees apart. You'd have three angles the same. But here you're saying one of them is smaller than the other two. So you have to orient it just right, something like that. No, you could you could make you could make the same angles even if you bend it, you know. But then you could not make. Then you could not complete complete the building at the end. But it's like it has to right. do with the fact that you know hexagons make a sheet, and you have to introduce exactly twelve pentagons in order to make a curved in itself shape. The the amount of hexagons is actually variable, mm -hmm. not free but variable. And that's the smallest one after the pentagon dodecahedron, which doesn't have any hexagons. Uh, so you're saying that's the smallest of the of the buckyballs, and you can make them larger so, than yes, the C60. Exactly, exactly. I think what's it? Exactly. C84 is maybe the next one, or C70 um, is one you find later. But that's like a, a rugby ball, you know. It's, ah, it's yes. like elongated. It's not spherical. Okay, that's the one you right. find. So the next peak you see in the mass spectroscopy when you do it, when you okay. build them in, in nature. Yeah. Okay. Um, so let's let's go back to talk uh, a bit more about um, your your quantum physics sculptures. And there's a piece called Quantum Man, which we're going to show. And right. uh, I, I really like this piece because I feel that it gets at something deep in the science as well as being a piece of art that works on its own terms. And I think for me, it's because the form matches the content extremely well. And I want to talk a bit more about that. But let's just first show the the, the piece. Um, I'm not sure if we have a couple of different views of it, which we might be able to, to pull up. But uh, when you look at it from one angle, it looks like a man standing there. Uh, yeah. But you look from the side and it practically disappears. Right. And, and we can see there yeah. that it's made up of a, a series of, of plates and uh, it's on something of an angle. It's partly transparent, um, as you can see through some of it, but you can still see some of the solid forms of these plates. Um, tell us a, a, a bit about the thinking behind this piece. Okay. Yeah, that was interesting, actually. It, it all started again in my physics group, where we had always these, these breakfasts together. And, and the guy I was mentioning, Anton Seidinger, who was, a, who, was, who was the PI there, he made this joke one morning and said, well, it can't possibly be a, co uh, be a coincidence that a walking man has exactly the, the Planck length as, the, as its matter wavelength. So translated, that means the Planck length is, is that's a, it's, a, it's a bit tricky if you don't know what that is. It's, if, if you take the, the main f f constants of nature and, 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 and derive from that like, like a fundamental length and other units, then you end up at a really, really small length of 10 to the minus 35 meters. So that's, a, that's really small. And, and it happens to be, and that's in all likelihood a coincidence, that if you have a 100 kilo man, or a little less maybe, and he walks with a few meters per second, or kilometers per second, um, that this pretty much works out if you use the de Broglie relationship of momentum and wavelength. If, if you look at this person as a quantum object, that this would be roughly the wavelength of that quantum object, a man see, be seen as a quantum object. And so okay, that made me, yeah. Yeah, we've gone through a lot of physics there. So let's just uh, run through a couple of the little pieces again, because I know a lot of our viewers aren't physicists, um, but uh, we're pretty interested in this. And so you're, you're saying that the basic idea is that any piece of matter can act like a wave. 
It's just that right. this wave-like property is an extremely short wavelength, much shorter than you typically see for uh, for uh, light or anything that you usually consider a wave. And uh, in fact, it's so short for a person walking or jogging or running that the uh, the wavelength of that person is roughly the the Planck length, um, and the the Planck length is also uh, considered by some people potentially the smallest unit of length that's, that's possible to exist in the universe, that maybe space-time actually becomes uh, discrete and, and has a structure to it down at the Planck length. But that's, uh, as you say, at about 10 to the minus 35 metres, which is such a small number, I'm not even sure how we try to convey um, how small that is. Yeah, it's tiny. Yeah, right. absolutely. Okay. So, so basically the idea is, that was his joke, but the idea was that it is, is very simple. How would such a wave function look like? You know, if you take a buckyball and you look at the, at the, at the um, center of mass movement, it's, it's a point moving in space in Newtonian physics. But if you go from Newtonian to, to quantum physics, the point becomes a fuzzy entity. It's still in the vicinity of the point, but if you look at the math of it, it becomes an object that has wave fronts. It's a, it has an oscillatory quality in space and time. And the, and the wave fronts are perpendicular to the direction of motion. So if I shoot it away like this, then the wave fronts will be like this. And that's true for every quantum object. That's, it's, that just follows from general relativity, uh, special relativity. If you transform an oscillatory thing into a moving frame, then you see that kind of wave. Um, so my, my, my thinking was basically, how could I use that, that idea? Because as you said, what I want to do is to connect those two worlds. And it's connecting means to put yourself mentally into it. And so it's, it's basically the question, what would happen if I am a quantum object? Um, so, so then I started out, I had initially the idea actually to make spherical wave pieces. And, and connect them and make the shape of the walking person. And and turned out that was hard. That was good that it was hard because when I finished it, I realized how cool this effect is because they're all parallel and plain. You know, the thing is, looks solid and then you walk around it and it's, it's really is, is almost gone. It's especially pronounced if you do it in stainless steel where the light bounces like in a glass fiber, it bounces between each slice, and, and, and if a car drives by, even without seeing it, you see the lights go through the piece, and it's, it's a really neat effect. So I was happy that, that, that it, I didn't make it the way I had initially planned. Yeah, um, I, I really like this piece because it works for me on so many different levels. And as I mentioned, it, it, for, for me, it works as a piece of science art because the form matches the, the content so well. Uh, do you think that's an important um, part of making good science art, having the, the form match the content? I think that applies for every art and everything, basically. That, that needs to be, you, the whole thing needs to be unit, form and content especially. That's true, a good paper in science or a good piece of art, or whatever you do in life, basically. Maybe that's a bit too generalized, but yes, I think that is important. Right. I mean, the reason I bring it up is that there are a lot of science artists out there doing all kinds of work, and some of it looks very pretty um, and might be quite interesting. But it, it often doesn't seem to work really well as a piece of art for me. It's more a, an illustration, even if it's an illustration in, in three dimensions or as a sculpture or something like that. It's really just showing the science um, rather than working as a piece of art. Yeah. Yeah, I'm not... Yeah. I, I have the same feeling. For me, it's, I'm not interested mostly in the science. I'm interested in nature. And science is one way of looking at it. That's, that's where I come from. I'm not, it's not about the, I, you know, we can go to the exploratorium for that. That can be beautiful too, but it's not what I'm interested in. Mm -hmm. So uh, how, how difficult do you find it to come up with topics for these uh, pieces where you can find this real unity of the, the form and the content and a, and a really strong idea that, that comes through? It's very challenging. And it, I think, I think a, another big issue is that 
that it's it's born out of the craft mostly. I mean, you, you can do only so much reading and thinking and having a brainchild, but at some point you have to do something with your hands, and that's and the, it, it, the, the, the famous accident in art is, is just so important. Even if you don't call it an accident, the, 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 somehow your body does stuff and finds things when you use your hand, which is a different than when we just use our, like the daylight kind of logical part of our brain. It's hard to explain, but maybe you know do what you, I mean. Uh, I think I do, but uh, do you have an example of when this has happened uh, in your work? Is there, you, you've gone in with some particular in, intention and then through the process of physically manipulating the materials, it's led you along a different path? Yeah, I mean, it's an, an example would be the quantum man with what I had initially wanted to do and then, and then mm -hmm. how it kind of all came together when, when the planes, the, the, the sheets were plain. Um, others is the buckyball, for example. Initially, the, the first version of this big buckyball, I, I hung into trees because I, it, I, I noticed it collapses on me. I tried to build it without, and then it, 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 I just needed to, to hang it somehow. And that, but that made it all meaningful because the whole idea of the quantum object is that stuff intersects and there is no clear-cut boundary. And, and then I went with that idea in the real version you saw in the picture. And, and it's all about this intersection of the mathematical shape and the natural trees. Uh, should we wait oh. just a second for your phone to finish <laughs> ringing <laughs> before we talk again? Let me hang it up. All right. Stick, stick with us, viewers. We've uh, Julian's a very popular man, obviously, with all his phones ringing today. You know, the phone stays just a moment now. <laughs> Sorry for that. My That's... phone always announces who's calling. But in <laughs> such a way that you can't, it, you, it's impossible to know what he's talking about or she. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, let's get back to talking about the, the science. Uh, uh, and this, I want to go back again to the relationship between form and content because there's another piece of yours that I think uh, represent the, represents this extremely well, and that's the Heart of Steel um, project. Okay. Yeah. And uh, here we have it on screen. And this is three photographs taken at three different times of the same piece. How, how far apart were these taken? Um, this, the first one is right after the unveiling. The second one was 10 days, I believe. Um, and the last one, I took that two times, and that was, I think, the dark one, which was a few months, like four months or something like that. Okay, so and you've you got can a, piece see of, a piece of art that's changing a lot over time. Um, uh, but how about you tell us what the, what the art is and what this piece is, what the molecule is, and why okay. it matters so much that it changes over time. Okay. Well, the molecule is, is hemoglobin, which is obviously the, 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 the protein in our blood cells, which makes it look red, first of all. And, and second of all, it, it, carries, it has the function to, to carry oxygen from the lungs to the rest of our body. And it does this by having a few iron atoms in there, which connect in a complex way in this protein structure with, with one oxygen atom each and um and when i when i had the idea to to make a hemoglobin based sculpture i was intrigued by that by that simple seemingly simple chemical reaction because we see it all the time in sculpture you know we make a piece shiny and then after a while it corrodes and it's also interesting to quote that in the art context, if you look at 60s sculpture, they often look like this. This is a specific steel called Core 10. It's weathering steel with lots of nickel. So it corrodes and then it, it stays like that. It doesn't get eaten up by the water, but it's kind of, it, it puts a, like a layer of, of oxide on, on top of it. And then that's it, it stays like that. So I, I was just intrigued at putting this together and, and having the same reaction occur on the surface of the sculpture that essentially occurs in our every breathing we take. So this uh, this hemoglobin molecule, your sculpture, is in some sense breathing air, uh, just yeah. as we would, and going through many of the similar reactions. Right. What, what what did people think of this sculpture when it starts as this uh, nice, bright and shiny object, <laughs> and then ten days later it's starting to yellow, and a few months later it looks like a rusted old well, piece of something. I kept telling them that's on purpose. 
<laughs> and they believed it? <laughs> well, after they saw those, those time-lapse images and it appeared like in different places, including like the Spanish newspaper El País. So at, the, at some point, I think they believed me that it was actually intentional. <laughs> Well, that's that's good to know. Um, yeah. Let's let's have a look at a, a couple of other pieces uh, of your work. Um, and again, another quantum physics piece, something called Night Path, uh, okay. which which uh, is a very different kind of work. It's no longer based on the on the uh, the, the the proteins. Um, and right. uh, tell us a little about this one. Well, this this came from from studying quantum physics, of course, again. And and if you when you when you um, at some point you encounter the way Richard Feynman derived um, um, the, the quantum mechanical framework by basically what he did is he looked at what if if I want to have a particle go from point A to point B um, it he he what he does is he slices up time and sums up the likelihood of the particle to go from A to B. For all different spaces, I mean, all different paths through 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 everywhere. It doesn't even need to be, you know, it can be totally unphysical paths. But it turns out that the the paths around the vicinity of the Newtonian path, the classical physics path, are the most important ones in terms of likelihood. So they kick in most when you do the calculation. And I had this one project in physics where we did that using a Monte Carlo method, where we basically took the pseudo random uh, generator in the computer to to roll the dice, so to speak, for, for many millions of those paths to get a to to calculate the likelihood to go from A to B, um, and that's an intriguing visual image for me. It, it it reminded me of the quantum man. If you remember, there were these slices, and they were connected by these randomly placed connectors, or pretty randomly, let's say it that way. Um, and, and I always felt this reminded me of, of this path integral approach of Feynman. So this piece I, I finally made only about that by taking these slices, these slabs of steel, and having basically programming a little, writing a little piece of code that, that would make a pseudo-random kind of mix of dots on, on the steel in this around the parabola, around the classical path of a of, of a ball thrown through the air. Um, unlike the Feynman approach, by the way, it, it doesn't end, go from one spot to the, from one defined point to the other, but it, it ends in one point or it begins, no matter, depending how, which way around you look at it, and then opens up. So I, I see it, I did that because it reminded me of a, um, of the, the image of a, of, a, of a comet, you know, a meteor, um, like like the, the Star of Bethlehem or whatever it's called, like in the Bible, you see that many other depictions all over the world. And you know, this this I just thought there was a neat kind of connection so, somehow with the gold and the blue. Right. So this is something like throwing a ball and watching it uh, move through space, leaving behind a trail of quantum probabilities or something like that. Yeah, yeah, or, yeah. Or you could look at it in a, in a classical way of, of you you shoot something from a from a from a cannon with a very short um, um, a pipe. So so it's, it's 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 it gets more and more unlikely to stick at the exact same path. So it kind of like um, fuzzies out or something like that. Right. So so in this case, the uh, the ball would be starting in the in the the cannonball in the lower right, right. where it's a, a right. well defined point. And then as it goes up through space and moves across, uh, it's, uh, it's spreading out to have some kind of uh, distribution or a, um, a arrangement of, of targets. So it's, it's not, right. quite, not quite perfect. And that's almost right. like what the, the quantum fluctuations uh, would right. do to an object moving. It'll add a little yeah. bit of uncertainty as to exactly how this path will, will play out right. in the end. And right. I try to not bias the piece by my hand and my eye. So I actually followed, I, I used the computer to, to, to calculate those, those paths and then, and then try to find the right exact hole, you know, for each of those threads, which is, was very tricky. Because the more yeah. you get, the harder it gets to fill them through the other ones that are already there. Yeah, yeah. So uh, you're obviously using computers quite a lot in your, um, in your artwork. Uh, tell me about that. That relationship and how that works for you. Okay. Yeah. Well, I, you know, I've, I, I just love computers. I, it was, it's, it's, a, I, it's, it's like deeply ingrained in me. I was one of the first people in 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 my hometown Germany we, who used a computer that was in 
1982, I had my first C64, and I just, I, I did nothing else but programming day and night. And unfortunately, I didn't know any math at that time, and I was really bad in school, that didn't help. And so, but I still have this romantic relationship, and I always try to write games and stuff. Um, and, and when I studied physics, I mean, of course, the computers were super important, but some, somehow when I, when I started knowing a lot about math, I realized for, for how beautiful it would have been to know the math stuff, especially the math that describes nature and, and, and computers, because somehow I always had this feeling that the world is essentially algorithmic in character. I mean, it's not clear if it's all 100% algorithmic, probably not, but, but it has very strong quality of that. And so it, it was always for me a metaphor for the f workings of the universe, so to speak. Mm -hmm. and there's so some you, interesting new research about that, like that the, the universe, the quantum computer and so on. So it's an old idea that's still very, very strong. Right. Well, I wanted to ask you about that. How much do you subscribe to the idea of the universe as a computer? You know, I'm How far agnostic. Can you push that? I'm, I'm agnostic. I'm, I'm actually very, very careful about reductionism in general. I, I, I believe it's very easy to end on the wrong path. And I, I don't believe in in simplistic reductionism for sure. But on the other hand, it's incredibly satisfying to be able to model a whole lot of the world. But I think it would be foolish to think that everything is determined. I mean, that's obviously not the case, but even if you take, yeah, but for, I mean, quantum is another, it's a good example. In quantum physics, we really run into the problem that determinism we don't even need chaos theory. I mean, we see there's something stochastic, apparently stochastic about the world. And I think that's, that's beautiful too. It gives us room for free will, for example. Mm. So no, I, don't, I don't, certainly don't fully subscribe to, to, to a clockwork, Newtonian type of universe, definitely not. Do, do you feel that this is a, a fundamental tension in science art, the idea that so much science is reductionist, whereas art, tends to be more holistic. Yes, absolutely. I think that's, that's, that's the, the whole, where the whole dissonance comes from. Mm -hmm. but, but still you feel that science and art make good partners? I don't know. In general, for me, it's just what fascinates me. And, and it's part of my struggle to kind of find a coexistence of the two. It's, it's like intuition, intellect, you know, in your own personality. You can't do only one or the other. You have to find a balance. And it's for me, somehow, my job is to, to find a way to, to find peace with each other, you know, with these two things. Mm -hmm. Do you ever get any pushback from scientists on this front? saying, oh, this isn't, you know, how it, how it really works, or this isn't a very good way to represent it. Why don't you stick with the, the textbooks? Or are they uh, fairly well, accepting? I heard that. I heard those things. But, but, you know, mostly scientists actually think it's wonderful that somebody takes these things out of the science context and, and puts them as centrally experienceable things into the public realm. I think that's what I mostly hear, actually. Mm -hmm. And, and then what about artists? How, how do they uh, find your work, other artists? Well, that was a, it's a bit more difficult, that relationship. <laughs> why, why is that? <laughs> Tell me a little about that. You know, I went to art college and I was kind of, I felt, I, I felt pretty much alone, I have to say. Just, it's hard to explain, but most artists, and I, I hate to generalize, but I think it's, it's fair to say that most artists, when they even hear science, it's, it, there's such a deep sense of this is cold and inhuman, and, and I understand those, those, those feelings. What, what nobody has taught these people for the most part, and I think the school fails there for the most part, is, is, is to see science as a way to see the beautiful, to see the sublime, if you will, in nature. And, and that, that sense is basically non-existent in the arts community, is, is what was my sense so far. Mm -hmm. And that's too bad, I think. I, I think it is. I mean, I, 
there, there seems to be a growing science art movement at the moment around the world. A lot more people seem to be using uh, the ideas of science or the imagery or the iconography of science in their artworks. And as we talked about uh, a little before, sometimes uh, I, I feel that's probably not so successful because it's merely illustrative. It doesn't really get to anything deeper in the science or deeper in the art world. But we do see the influence moving typically from the science toward the art. Do you think that it can work the other way around? Do you think that art can uh, really influence science in any significant way? You know, I've heard this so many times, this question, but posed by people who write about that, and often they're struggling to find connections which can go this way around, and they're not all that convincing. I think a more fair answer is kind of to... I, I, you know, I, I don't think you can. It's, I, I don't know if of a very clear example, and I, it's probably not that strong, but that doesn't mean that it's not an important connection. I think it's like with the intellect and intuition again. If you, if you cultivate only one thing in a human being, then that, this is bound to be off balance, and that's not good for, for the overall health. And I think the same is true for society. If, if we do only science, and that's what's being funded, and that's where people make career, that's what's respected, then I think this is a very, very unhealthy relationship. Um, I, I don't really want to be in the position to say, oh, see, there's a piece of science that was inspired by art, and actually now you can make technology, you know, and make money off of this. Um, it's, I think you have to just trust. It's, it's a, a hugely important part of, of, of being a human. And, and the, the inspirations, subtle as they are, you know, they go crossways, and you have to just trust that. But I, I, I would be hard pressed to find a good example. I, I, one of the reasons I ask is that I have something of a, of a personal stake in that question, because yeah. I feel that some of my research uh, as a physicist was directly inspired by artwork. I can I can oh, really? put it down to very specific pieces of art. I won't go into that now because this isn't oh, uh, a show about me. But it's uh, maybe that's something you and I can talk about at at another time. Um, I, I, I do think it's possible, but it's it's not uh, not very common as far as I can tell. And so I'm curious to see if you've come across it in, in other other places. Um, are, are there other science artists out there doing work that you really admire for, for people who, who like uh, this kind of work and like your work? Are there other people that they should check out? Um, well, I in the, in the art science community, they're, they're very often very technology driven and I'm not, not I, I don't know anybody who's like, who, who, who I really admire a lot. I mean, there's, there's one, one sculptor I admire, but, and he has a, he has an interest in science, but he comes really from the, from the Eastern traditions of wisdom and meditation and stuff, but he, he connects it with, with modern concepts. That's, that's Anthony Gormley. He's also the reason why this piece is called Angel of the West, because he is a very famous sculptor, Angel of the North. But so that was kind of a play of, of that, that piece. Uh, okay. Um, we've seen a, a, a wide variety of your work, but uh, there are still many other types of pieces that we haven't had a chance to show today. So I'd certainly recommend uh, people go and check out your website. But could you tell us what else you're working on at the moment? Do you have something coming up that, that people might yeah. be able to see? Well, it's right now. Tonight, tonight is an opening of a, of a show here in Portland, where I have some some works together with another sculptor. Um, I don't think that's on my website, but it's in the in the first Thursday gallery openings tonight. So um, that's on nine thirty nine Gleason. If somebody's interested in coming, I'll be there too and say hi to me. That'd be fun. Um, Otherwise, and that goes a little bit to what the, what you just said with the art inside, with with art being inspiring for science. I'm I'm, I'm looking very much into, the, you know, all the energy healing stuff, the, what the Chinese call qi, and and I'm I'm interested in, in modeling stuff with a with a computer which looks like an aura or a field between humans or of a human. So maybe that is something that could actually inspire scientific research. But um, that's, that's what I'm working on right now most of the time. Okay, well, we, we look forward to, to seeing that. We're just about out of time, Julian, but I really appreciate you chatting with us today. Um, yeah, thank and, and want to thank you for, for coming on the, on the show. So thanks for joining us on Dr. Kiki's Science Hour and for, for sharing all of your sculpture with us. 
uh, to our viewers, make sure that you check out www.julianvossandre.com for more information about his work. We're about to wrap it up. I'm David Harris sitting in for Dr. Kiki. This has been Dr. Kiki's Science Hour. But uh, tune in next week when your host will be Jerry Ellsworth. Thanks very much for being with us today. Bye.